tracking along well. Let's go over the page and have a look at question 15. Now, again, for the uh, next couple of questions, there are some bits where um, there is a lot of writing. So I've written already in place so you don't have to wait for me. I'm a very slow writer. But we will talk about what I've written um, and some of the different ways that you could have answered these questions as well. So, um, you've got Enrico and he's deciding to conduct a study to examine the relationship between uh, students' abilities in these two different KLAs, these two key learning areas. In order to conduct his study, Enrico has requested records of all student scores from the school. So, one of the really important issues that we need to think about in using statistical measures is their ethical considerations. So, you can see the school is concerned with the privacy implica implications of the request. I uh, give a reason why they may be concerned and suggest a remedy. So here's what I've written and um, most students had a response like this. The school may be concerned because students have the right to keep their own scores private and that's kind of the key there that each person kind of has ownership over their own score. The scores in general are no one's data but the particular scores like saying I scored 30% and you scored 75% um, you having that piece of data is not something that belongs to me or vice versa. So that's why it's about keeping their own scores private. Um, it's personal data. So the way to address this concern would be, well, one of the ways, is to supply the scores without names or perhaps without even their class uh, attached to them. So we call that anonymizing the data. And that way, what you've got is an aggregated set of data. It's just like a big clump of data and you can't say, oh, this belongs to this person, this belongs to another person. People can't be identified by the data that you can see here in this uh, data set that's provided to Enrico. So that's what I suggested. Let's have a look at the next part. It says Enrico was granted access to the data and input it into a spreadsheet. And this is the scatter plot that he created, All right? Sketch a line of best fit by eye on the scatter plot below. So since we're scat doing this by eye, we know it's not going to be exactly accurate, but we do want to, number one, uh, you know, make sure that the line of best fit that we draw, um, it matches the, the gradient of what you would expect the line of best fit to do. So if, for example, you drew a line that had a positive gradient, that is clearly not fitting most of the data, so that's a bit of a dud. Uh, and then secondly, noticing, okay, if we want to have a negative line of best fit here, we also want to make sure that roughly the same amount of data points are above the data, uh, line of best fit rather, and the same uh, below. So for example, if I draw a line like this, um, the gradient is correct, but you can see that there's a lot missing on the bottom. You've got hardly any of the scores down there, and the vast majority of the scores are above. So if I draw a line roughly, I'm gonna expect it's gonna be somewhere around, I'm pretty happy with that there. Okay. Now, I talked about um, the errors before of getting the gradient wrong or perhaps getting too many points um, above or below. Another common error was just to take the leftmost data point and to join it to the rightmost data point. If I get rid of the blue line that I drew, you can see um, it's, a, it's a very easy mistake to make because it, it looks roughly right, um, but it's clearly got more data points above than below. So let's uh, get rid of that one. There we go. So this is what I'm going to use. Um, that's my line of best fit. Part C says, use your line of best fit to estimate an English score if the math score was 90. Um, and then we have some follow-on questions after that. So, um, let's find our math score of 90 and see where it meets our line of best fit. So, the math scores are the horizontal axis here. So, here's 90. Um, it's nice and easily identified. So, if I go up from 90 all the way up to the line of best fit, it roughly collides there. And then what I'm going to do is match that with a data point on the vertical axis, the English scores. So I'm going to draw all the way across. Oop. All right. So what do you got there? Uh, it's worth pointing out that everyone's going to draw a slightly different line of best fit, and that's fine. So your line of best fit may not look exactly like this, and your estimate as a result may not look exactly like mine. Um, looking at the scores there, that looks like something between... 58 and 59. So I'm going to say um, the English score, I'm using a pen that's too fat, let's fix that. That's better. The English score um, estimated is approximately 59. Now, that's only the first part of this question. 
we need to have a look at what the rest of it's asking. It says, is this a valid estimate? And then give reasons for your answer. And this is what really matters. This is what really counts. It's your ability not just to calculate statistics, but to interpret them and then use them appropriately. Is it a valid estimate? Now, this data set has actually been crafted deliberately so that like in the real world, you actually could answer in more than one way and provide justification in more than one way that actually um, you know, would be sound reasoning. So let me give you an example of why you might say yes. You might reason, yes, this is a valid estimate because this kind of estimate that we've done is what we call interpolation. Interpolation is when you're having a look within your data set as opposed to extrapolation, which is when you're looking outside your data set. So an example of looking outside your data set in this case would be, what if I had a student who scored 10 on their math score? 10 is very, very low. It's so low that it's beyond where I have actual data points. You can see my, my lowest math score here is around 24 or so. So if I were to estimate the score of a person who got a math score of 10, um, you know, my line of best fit says, wow, they would have done astronomically well in English. But is that valid? When it comes to extrapolation, it's very difficult to say because where the data has, has where there is no data point and um, there may be some other trend that takes over you know this line maybe it actually comes down if i had more data points so it's unclear because i don't possess the data there but in this case the estimate that i'm making is not extrapolation it's interpolation within the data set i've got data points below i've got data points above so i could say yes because interpolation is more accurate than extrapolation so that could be a way pardon my messy writing here, that could be a way that you provided the answer yes and then reasoned it. However, like I pointed out, um, you actually, if you look closely at this data, it's been crafted in a way that you could have said no and I'm just going to explain that to you right now for two reasons. Uh, number one, if you have a look up in the top right hand corner of this graph, so let me just get rid of some of these unnecessary lines here. If you have a look in this top right hand corner of the graph, we have some outliers. These are data points that are very, very far away from the line of best fit. They're nowhere near it, in fact. And what they represent is people who've done really well in maths, and they've also done really well in English. And I bet you have some friends who are just like this, uh, or maybe you're that friend. Now, for that reason, if you have a look here, there's this kind of gap in the data set. If I get rid of um, all these lines for a brief moment here, you can see in here, the point where I'm trying to make a prediction. For that score of 90, it just so happens that all of the actual data points, all the actual students who got scores around that, they did really well in English, not really badly. So to be able to say, oh, if you got a math score of 90, you definitely got an English score of 59, um, isn't borne out by the students who actually got marks around 90 in mathematics. So because of that gap in the data and the existence of outliers, and I'm gonna just write that down, outliers are present um, that indicate, you know what, you may have actually got a high mark in maths um, and also um, a high mark in English at the same time. So we might say um, they're present, uh, outliers are present that indicate um, high achievers in both subjects. Um, that's a bit of a uh, problem with the data that means you could interpret it and say this estimate actually we can't use um, to uh, predict a student's score. Um, so I'm going to write in both subjects. Um, the other point, of course, is that it's not just the data that tells us this. Um, it's also the fact that, like I said, we know students like this. Um, a student who is tremendously well organized, um, very disciplined, has a supportive home environment. All these factors don't just help you in one subject. They help you in all your subjects, and that might be English and math. So actually, we have very good real world data to be able to suggest to us a high score in one subject could also correlate to a high score in both. So that's why you could just as easily have argued, no, this is not a valid estimate. The key was, did you provide good reasons for your argument? Okay, so we're coming toward the end of our statistics questions. Let's have a look at part D and E. We'll do this in one hit. Enrico found Pearson's correlation coefficient to be negative 0.5, and then he found the equation of his least squares regression line. Describe the relationship between English and math scores at Enrico's school um, by referring to the strength of the correlation as well as the gradient of the regression line. Okay, so a few things here. Um, let's do it one by one. Um, the strength of the correlation, 
what is the strength of the correlation here? Well, earlier we were looking at a question where we got a correlation coefficient of 0 0.94 or something like that, which is very high. This correlation coefficient of negative 0.5 well, you know, it's not completely random. It's not a correlation coefficient of zero, um, but it's not sticking closely. And you could see that on the original graph, um, even though they are very gently, gradually following that line of best fit, they're still kind of all over the place. So that's why you can see I've written here, let me just highlight it in red. I've written that there's a moderate negative correlation. And negative, just to remind you from before, talked about the fact that there's this uh, gradient that's, that's downward as we go across the graph. So it's a moderate negative correlation. What that indicates is, as you can read, students do more poorly in English when they excel in mathematics. And we could have swapped around the axes and um, shown that the uh, vice versa is also true. If you mostly do well in English, you don't do all that well in mathematics for this particular data set. Now what that's suggesting, a possible hypothesis, a conclusion you could draw from that is maybe what students are doing is they're splitting their time between English and math. So the more time you spend on one, the less you spend on the other. And so if you invest more in one, you're going to do better there. And that means your performance in the other one decreases in a corresponding amount. Speaking of corresponding amount, the question also says you should refer to the gradient of the regression line. Now, I've talked about the sign of the gradient, I've written about that, but I haven't written about the actual value of it. So you can see here, um, let's uh, highlight another color. The gradient, I read off the equation of the least squares regression line. The gradient is negative 0.2. And what that means is, this is the rise over run, yeah? So there's a rise of negative 0.2. In other words, your marks decrease 0.2 every time you have a run of one. So the run here indicates, if you have a look at the original graph, run horizontally, that's maths marks, right? So one maths mark, as you go to the right of the graph, means you decrease by 0.2 of an English mark, roughly speaking anyway, according to this line of best fit. So I didn't write that, I ran out of space here, but that would be a better, more t um, accurate way to specifically refer to the actual gradient that does get provided to you within the question up there. All right, last statistics question for the paper. Can this least squares regression line be used to predict mathematics or English scores for students in other schools? Give a reason to justify your response. So my suggestion is that you can't use these to predict scores in other schools. And that's because there are loads of factors that influence um, the prediction of scores. And they differ from one school to the next. Perhaps, you know, one school has an amazing mathematics faculty and all the teachers there are brilliant. And you go to a different school and they're not so great. And that's obviously going to have a huge impact on the performance of students in mathematics assessment tasks. So because those two factors have changed completely, you wouldn't expect that you could predict the results of that school on the results of this school. And it's pretty difficult to argue um, an opposite case here because there are just so many factors in the opposite direction.